Thank you. Can y'all, I just, can the band just stay with me the whole time? This is yes, awesome. Actually, you can go. You can go. What a great honor it is to be here. Thank y'all so much for having me. Can you give it up for your pastor, Sean Wood and Connie? What great leaders they are. As, as Sean said, we met back in 2001, and I can remember some, some crazy times. I mean, if you guys remember something else happened in 2001, uh, 9-11 happened. And I remember Sean and I just getting to know each other, going into high schools and, and middle schools, trying to make sense of this to kids. I can remember some fun times. He had me dancing to the band NSYNC uh, as a part of our announcements at Seacoast. I don't know if you remember that, Sean. You, I'm sure you've done that here as well. But, but we've just had an incredible time. But you know what stood out to me? I was thinking about this as we were worshiping together. Uh, we, Seacoast, uh, just like you guys are in this step-in campaign and season as a church, we are taking some major steps towards uh, kingdom impact, and we're in the middle of a construction project right now uh, where we're building a 2,500-seat worship center, and, and a huge financial uh, goals that we had, and uh, just incredible faith step for us, and the very first check that ever came in for Seacoast Imagine the, the, the Possibilities campaign came from Freedom Church through Sean Wood. He brought it himself. He wanted to make sure they invested before anybody else. And so I can say as a church that was a part of planting you guys, but it's also received your generosity. Thank you for what you're doing. We love you guys. And frankly, we're, we're family and you don't get to choose family. So whether you like that or not, we're here. Uh, you know, how many of you know you didn't get to choose your parents or your big brothers and sisters? And so that's just kind of it. Seacoast and Freedom. We love each other. Love serving in this, this city with you and excited about what's going on. I want to introduce my family to you. I've got a picture uh, of, of our crew. I think we've got up on the screen. So that's us. Uh, how many love it when a, a photo shoot it starts pouring about five minutes into it. So that's what happened to us. And so we're all wet there. But that's my wife, Lisa. My son, Miles, who's nine. He's sitting on the front row. He is here with us today. And then uh, my two daughters, Greta Kate is seven. And Ellie is hanging upside down. Uh, she didn't drop her, I promise you. She is our little three-year-old. And we're just having so much fun as a family. Love doing life and ministry here in the Charleston area. And then let me ask you, we're in Berkeley County. I don't know what is Berkeley County a dog county or a cat county? Are you guys, you guys into dogs? Any dog people in the house? Okay, a lot of dog people. It's great. I, I've kind of been a no pet person uh, personally. That's kind of my philosophy. But over the last year, my wife and my kids have been just all over me. We want to get a dog. We want to get a dog. We want to get a dog. And so I was talking to a, a wise friend of mine, and he said, so Josh, you're telling me that your wife wants a dog, your kids want a dog but you don't want a dog. I said, that's, that's exactly right. He said, okay, well, tell me what you named the dog. Uh, and so we did get a dog, and I've got a picture of, of, of uh, her too. This is Pippa, and uh, I'm sure that she will be checked into Freedom Kids later this morning because she has fully become a part of our family. Uh, she's a French bulldog. I love French bulldogs because they're kind of the male accessory dog. They're small enough you can carry them. They're as ugly as can be, but they're so ugly that they're cute. But, but we finally caved, and we got this dog. And uh, Pippa, by the way, I'm a Chicago sports fan, so Cubs, Bulls, all that. So thank you. There's one of us here, too. That's great. And so I caved on the name Pippa because it's short for Scotty Pippen for me, who is, you know, was a basketball player for the, for, for the Bulls. And so that's, that's that. But, but we got this dog, and here was the, the, the framework for it. I said, we will do this, but kids, this is your dog. Every piece of poop that has to be scooped in the yard is going to be done by you. Every feeding that this dog has is going to be done by you. When the dog needs to go out in the rain, it is going to be done by you. This is your dog. And so we had this great big responsibility talk, and it was incredible. And, and it worked brilliantly for two weeks, brilliantly for two weeks. And I don't know if y'all remember a few months ago, but we had just a, a really cold stretch for about two or three days. It was like 25 degrees. Here in the south, that is, that's catastrophic. We, we shut everything down, but it's really, really cold. And our kids had this system for taking the dog out in the morning, and it was basically this. They took turns. So every, uh, every other day was, was their turn for the two older kids. And so my son, Miles, and my daughter, Greta Kate, would take turns. Well, uh, on the morning of the 26-degree weather, it was a Saturday morning, so mom and I were trying to sleep in a little bit, and it was Greta Kate, my seven-year-old's turn to take the, or actually, no, it wasn't. It was Miles's turn to take the dog out, but he slept in a little bit. So Greta Kate got up first, and it was her turn to take, the, or it was, it was her brother's turn to take the dog out. She gets up. And it's 25 degrees outside, and the dog has got to go. The dog is whimpering and crying, and it's great, but it wasn't her turn. And so she went downstairs, and she had some breakfast, and you know, she watched a little TV. Meanwhile, the dog is, is howling to get out, but, but it wasn't her responsibility that day. And so I wake up to the kids fighting, 
and, and I go to the dog crate, and there has been an explosion inside of that crate that includes every number that you can come up with. And I'm not going to get into detail, but it was just, it was awful. It's awful. And, and, and what, what had happened is this dog desperately needed someone to show it some attention and some love and some care. But because it wasn't her turn or her responsibility that day, my, my daughter was downstairs enjoying breakfast while a disaster was going on in this dog's life. And, and it frustrated me for a lot of reasons. I mean, one, I thought about myself. I even thought about Berkeley County as I was thinking about this today. I wonder how many people are, are dying for attention. They're dying for somebody to, to, to share with them, to, to help them maybe even clean up the messes that have come of their lives. And so often we become so comfortable just doing our thing. We're having our breakfast we're watching our shows, not paying any attention to it. But, it. but it bugged me because I saw in my kids, they were just trying to get by with the bare minimum. I even sent them downstairs and I said, all right, y'all are going to come up with a plan to make sure this never happens again. So they went down, they talked it through, they came back up and they said, all right, dad, we've got a plan. We're going to now take turns for who takes the dog out. I'm like, that sounds a lot like the same plan that got us into this, this problem in the first place. And I had to explain to them that the dog is not a chore. It's not like you're just sweeping the floor. This is a, a, a life that we're taking care of. And it frustrated me because they were just trying to get by with the bare minimum. And if I'm being honest with you, Freedom Church, it reminded me a lot of myself sometimes. In my marriage, am I the only one that sometimes gets into this mode where I'm just trying to get by with the bare minimum? You know, just kind of doing, do, doing what's required of me, not going above and beyond. Certainly in my parenting, it happens Often, <laughs> you know, especially when Lisa's not home and I'm responsible for getting the kids to bed, come about 8.30 at night. It's like, I don't care if you brush your teeth. I don't care if you pray. I don't just get in bed. I'm done. I'm, I'm, I'm finished. Every now and then, I kind of get into this mode, even in my, my job. And even when I think about the people around me, I'll kind of be tempted, and I think all of us will, to slip in to coast mode, to slip into just getting by with the bare minimum. And you know what I want to talk to you guys about is I prayed about Sean asked me to come and, and speak. I, I really want to encourage you guys w with a word today because I feel like when I look at what God's doing at Freedom Church, it is remarkable. I mean, I know you have a front row seat and I know you're here, most of you week in and week out. Maybe you haven't quite realized that what's happening inside of these walls and outside of these walls in Berkeley County is not normal. This is not normal. What we just experienced together in worship, this is not normal. The anointing that is on this house is incredible. I mean, think about it. In, in six or seven short years, we've gone from a dream in, in Pastor Sean and Connie's heart to now we're seeing 1,500 people every single weekend. You guys have become one of the great churches in all of Charleston, let alone Berkeley County, making a huge difference. We've got this incredible facility now that you're meeting in, but it, it would be very easy in a moment like this, and in fact, most churches, when they get to this place, they kind of slip into this, this coast mode. You know what? Let's, let's take care of what we have. I mean, 1,500 people, God's done some incredible things. Let's, let's just kind of turn inward and focus on what we have. But that's not what God wants for Freedom Church. God is just getting started with Freedom Church. And if, if God's going to do all that he wants to do in you and through you, it's going to require us to be extra mile kinds of people. And so what I want to do, I want to, I want to share a story from the Bible with you. And it's a story of a, a woman named Rebecca. Some of you may be familiar with this woman named Rebecca. She ends up being one of the more famous people in, in the Bible. But her story runs in stark contrast to what happened in my home uh, with my kids doing the bare minimum. It runs in stark contrast to this, this urge that all of us have to slip into coast mode in various areas of our lives. You may remember Rebecca, the, the story really starts with Abraham. And Abraham, if you grew up in church, you know Father Abraham had many sons. I am one of them, and so are you. Let's just, you guys remember that, that story. But, but God had made a promise to Abraham that he's going to have descendants that number as many as the stars that are in the sky. And they have this heartbreaking journey of infertility, and they have just trial after trial after trial. And finally, a miracle comes when Sarah is almost 100 years old. And, and they have this baby, and his name's Isaac. And you would think that's the miracle, and now the family's going to start to happen. But here's the problem. Isaac now, their son, has become a grown man. Sarah's actually, Abraham's wife has died, and Isaac's a grown man. And, and I don't know what the story was. I don't know what was going on in Isaac's life, but, but he's still living at his parents' house. And he's had a little bit of tough luck when it comes to the, the marriage department, finding the right woman for him. 
And, and so I don't know, I know that his, um, when he had eventually had babies, the kid that they named after Isaac, because he looked like him, literally he named him Furry, and so it could be that Isaac had a little problem kind of with the, the manscaping uh, issue, his hairy man, and uh, he maybe wasn't that good looking. I don't know what it was. Maybe he was still living at home, and so uh, rich parents, maybe he had this entitlement attitude. All I know is that he was struggling. I'm sure he was on, you, you know, all the right um, apps. I'm sure he was on Farmers Only. And uh, he's, he's just getting swipe left, swipe left, swipe left. And so nobody's showing any interest. And, and Abraham's going, dude, God literally intervened by giving us a baby with a miracle. And he promised me that I was going to have all these grandkids and I was going to have all these descendants. And, and Isaac, you got to get with the program, man. You're messing up the whole plan. You got to find yourself a girl. And so what Abraham does is he takes the, the situation into his own hands He puts a plan together. He takes a servant in his home named Eleazar, and he says, I'm sending you out on a mission. And what you have is Eleazar goes back to Abraham's homeland, and literally it's the very first episode of The Bachelor. He's going, and he's going to look among all the women, and he's going to find a woman that would be suitable for his son to marry. So that's the context for where we meet this girl, Rebecca. We're going out, and this, this is the biblical version of Chris Harrison. They're on The Bachelor. They're trying to figure it out. And, and here's what happens. It's in Genesis chapter 24. I'll just kind of read the story. And by the way, if you are uh, single here today, there's some great principles here for you as well. That's not going to be kind of the focus of the message, but there are some great principles. But I want you to, as we read this story, I want you to look at what, what you see in the life of Rebecca. And we're going to see if we can learn some things from her. So it says in verse 10, then the servant left, taking with him 10 of his master's camels, loaded with all kinds of good things from his master. There's a lesson if you're single. Notice he didn't come empty-handed. He sent, he sent this guy with all kinds of good things, all kinds of stuff. So dudes, if you're looking for your girl, don't come empty-handed. Come with some good things. And he, he had the camels kneel down near the well outside of the town. And it was towards evening, the time when the women go out to draw water. It says, then he prayed, which by the way, I don't know what you're facing in your life today, Pastor Sean mentioned earlier, some of us may be, be, be in a dry season. Whatever you need, if you, don't, if, you, if you don't pray, you know, the failure to pray is the highest form of arrogance that we can have as humans. It's basically saying, hey, I got this. But, but this guy, he realizes that the task at hand, he needs God's intervention. He needs God's favor. He needs God's hand involved in his life. So he stops and he prays. And he says, Lord, God of my master Abraham, make me successful today. Please show kindness to my master Abraham. See, I am standing beside this spring and the daughters of the townspeople are coming out to draw water. May it be that when I say to a young woman, please let down your jar that I may have a drink. And she says, drink and I'll water your camels too. Let her be the one that you've chosen for your servant, Isaac. By this, I will know that you've shown kindness to my master. So he prays a very specific prayer. If you're praying for a spouse for your child, or maybe you're praying for somebody for yourself, don't just pray, Lord, send me the first available. He gets very targeted. He knows what kind of woman would would fit well into their family, and he knows what they're going for. And he's going, guys, God, I want want specifically for you to intervene with a woman who would, would have a heart of a servant, who'd be the kind of woman who'd go the extra mile. And then in verse 15, before he had finished praying, Rebecca came out with her jar on her shoulder. Don't you wish it always happened like that? Like before he's done praying, the answer is there. That's not how it always works out in my life. I don't know about you. But in this case, God intervenes right then and there. And this woman shows up. She's the daughter of Bethuel, son of Milcah, who was the wife of Abraham's brother Nahor. The woman was very beautiful, a virgin. No man had ever slept with her. She went down to the spring, filled her jar, and came up again. So the servant hurried to meet her. Notice he, he, he saw something and he went, went after it. Some of y'all need to get in a hurry. You already got the woman in your life and you need to go ahead and get in a hurry and, 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 and get a ring on her. But that's what happened. He rushes over. He says, please, can I have a little bit of water from your jar? She says, drink, my Lord. And quickly she lowered the jar to her hands and gave him a drink. After she had given him a drink... She said, I'll draw water for your camels too until they have had enough to drink. So she quickly emptied her jar into the trough, ran back to the well to draw more water, and then drew enough for all of his camels. 
Without saying a word, the man watched her closely to learn whether or not the Lord had made his journey successful. And after she finished watering all of his camels, the man took out a gold nose ring, weighing, that, that's probably not the best route for you, by the way, as we're kind of rocking this single thing, maybe get a different kind of ring, but he took out a nose ring, it worked, and he put it on her. He also brought out two gold bracelets weighing 10 shekels. And then he asked, whose daughter are you? Please tell me, is there room in your father's house for us to spend the night? She answered him, I'm the daughter of Bethuel, the son that Milcah bore to Nahor. And she added, we have plenty of straw and fodder as well as room for you to spend the night. And then the man bowed down and worshiped the Lord, saying, praise be to the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who has not abandoned his kindness and faithfulness to my master. As for me, the Lord has led me on the journey to the house of my master's relatives. So, so, so he, he realizes in this moment, he sees something in this woman that he says, man, I, God has led me to, to the right person. There's so much in this story. But, but I want to kind of help you see what's... I know we're in Berkeley County, uh, but y'all don't have camels in Berkeley County. But I didn't really understand how all of this worked. How you, how, what does it take to water camels? So you've got this, this girl... Rebecca, and she's got this jar. It's probably a little bigger than this one, but she's also probably a lot stronger than I am. And so she's carrying this jar, and she's, she's going to the well like any other woman would, just kind of walking, doing her thing, going to the well. And she would then dip this jar, so literally dip it down into the water. She would let it down. It would probably take a while to get down to where the water is, fill it up with water. She brings it back up. Now it weighs a ton, and it's on her shoulder, and she's walking. And that's when this guy runs up to her. At this point, she's like every other woman there. And so she lets the jar down and she gives him some water. And then she makes an incredibly ridiculous proposal. She says, hey, do you mind if I water your camels as well? Does anybody remember we just read it? How many camels were there? Ten. Ten camels. So I've never watered camels before. I don't know exactly how this works. So I did a little research. And here's kind of the most conservative estimate that, that people would say is that to water ten camels until they were not thirsty anymore, which is what it said it did, It would have taken her about an hour and a half to do it. Can you imagine that? An hour and a half out of her day. And I don't know how far they are from the well, but she's literally going back to the well. She's dipping this thing back down into it. She's pulling it back up. She's walking it back over to where the camels are. She's letting them drink. And then she's walking back. I'm sure she had stuff to do. I'm sure family was waiting for her to get home. But she went above and beyond what was required of her. And out of that, God drastically changed her life. So I want to talk to you guys for just a couple of minutes about what would it look like for us to be the kind of people who live our lives in the extra mile, who, who, when, when, when the people of Monk's Corner in Berkeley County would say, hey, have you heard about Freedom Church? Have you heard about what's happening over there? It wouldn't so much be about the incredible facilities and, and the great music, but it would be, man, that's a group of people who serves like crazy. That's a group of people who goes the extra mile. Before I, I unpack what the, the story shows us, what is the extra mile? What am I talking about? You know, Matthew 5, 41, Jesus actually coined this term. He says, if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them for two miles. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them for two miles. What does that mean? Does that mean like if you decide with a friend, hey, we're going to go for a run, uh, we're going to run a mile together, uh, when you get to the end of that mile, you, you turn and say, hey, let's go for another one. No, don't, do, don't be that guy. Okay, please don't be that guy. My wife is that person. Like, no, we agreed to run one mile. That's all we're doing. The, the context for, for Jesus' statement was actually in Israel where, uh, where, where they were. The Jews were living under Roman occupation. The Romans were in charge. And there was a law in the land that said if a Roman soldier approached a Jew... And, and told him to carry his armor, and a Roman soldier would have armor that would weigh about 100 pounds, that the law required that that Jewish person had to, without asking questions, carry his armor for one mile. Literally 1,000 left-footed steps. And so think about that. One, two, three. So literally that was the law. They, and I can imagine how they felt about that. I know how I would feel about that. I can imagine what they said under their breath when a Roman soldier would approach them, be like, oh, oh my gosh, you know, but that was the requirement. So they literally had to pick up this armor and carry it wherever they wanted to go for a thousand steps. I I can imagine that that would be frustrating. And then Jesus comes and says, hey, by the way, 
and, and this kingdom that I'm establishing and this, this world that we're going to be a part of that's different than the rest of the world, when, when a Roman soldier comes to you and says, hey, carry that armor for a thousand steps, I want you to go ahead and take it 2,000 steps for him. Can you imagine that? I mean, I, I know if I were a Jewish person, I know if I was asked to carry it a thousand steps, I'd pull out my Fitbit, right? And I would start my step counter and I would know exactly when that thousandth step was. And as soon as I got to that thousandth step, it's like, we're in the middle of the road, traffic's bad, here you go, have at it. But Jesus says, no, 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 do, do something a little bit differently. When you get to that thousandth step, I, I want you to turn to that Roman soldier and I want you to say, hey, would you mind if I carried this a little bit further for you? Would you mind if I served you a little bit more than what's expected? Can you imagine what that would say and communicate to a Roman soldier? Can you imagine that? I mean, they're doing their thing. They're kind of powering up on this guy, and they get to this point, and he's like, man, I'd love to serve you. I wonder how many Roman soldiers experienced the love of Christ because of that one statement that Jesus made. That's what God's calling us to do. That's the life that God's calling us to live. What's the extra mile? It's when I do more than what's expected. When I do more than what's expected. You know, Jesus often did this. He, he taught an extra mile principle. And he had all, all the time, the law, you know, the Old, Old Testament law would give these commandments. And Jesus was known as a guy who would go, yeah, that's, that's kind of a starting point. But what I want to see us do is take it even further. Think about it, the command, do not commit adultery. Very basic command. Jesus says, yeah, that's, that's good. But what I want you to do is don't even think about it. You know, don't even look at a, a woman with lust in, in your heart and your eyes. He takes it to a whole nother level. Jesus says, yeah, the Old Testament tithe principle, that's good. That's a baseline. But, but in my kingdom, here's what I want for you. Luke 14, he says, those of you who do not give up everything that you have can't be my disciples. Go a little bit further. Don't just give. Get involved in the, the step up, step in campaign. Get involved. Go, go a little bit further. It's when I do more than what's expected. It's when I say yes to things that I would normally say no to. When I say yes to things that I would normally say no to, Matthew 5, 40, Jesus said, give to the one who asks you. Do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. When I say yes to some things that I would normally say no to, I don't know if there are things in your life that you just have kind of gotten used to just going, ah, that's not really my thing. I know Miles and I were in New York City last summer, and uh, I had become so jaded to the homeless issue that I kind of didn't even notice it. And Miles even brought it up to me. He's like, Dad, all these people who need help, what, what about them? And I was like, oh, my gosh, I, I didn't even notice them. So I can remember giving him some cash, and I said, I just want you to, to say yes. Anytime somebody asks, I want you to say yes, because we can get so used to just, ah, that's not my thing. I don't normally do that. Many of you, you're here at Freedom Church because you said yes to something you would normally say no to. Just being in church feels like an extra mile kind of a thing for you, and I commend you for being here. So it's, it's when, I, when I go above and beyond what more than what's expected, when I say yes and I normally say no, and when I push beyond my comfort zone, when I push beyond my comfort zone, all of us have a place kind of where we're comfortable spiritually, physically. I know for me, I joined a gym uh, about a year ago, and I noticed as I started working out in this gym that there are a handful of people in the gym that have like these washboard abs that look like, I imagine what Pastor Sean's look like, just incredibly chiseled bodies, and, and I won't get into the story, but I lost my abs back in my sophomore year of college. I haven't seen them ever since then, and, and so I remember watching them and thinking, man, if I just go and do what they're doing, then, then I'll be in good shape, and I would do the workouts that the group would do together, and then I would go hit the showers and go to work, and these people that I noticed that looked a lot different than the rest of us, they would stay, and they would do more. They would push beyond their comfort zone. They would do extra workouts, and, and I know that now, and knowing is half the battle. I haven't done anything about it, but it's, it's, it's a good lesson to learn. They're going the extra mile. They're, they're, that's where growth happens. That's where change happens. It's in the extra mile. You know, if, if you're going to just do the same things this summer that you've done to get you to this point, then we can't whine or worry when we get the same results. 
We've got to be a people who say, man, I want to step in to the extra mile. So let's look at the story and three quick thoughts for you, what, what life in the extra mile looks like. And the first one is this. When I go the extra mile, people will notice. When I go the extra mile, people will notice. Let's go back to the story. Rebecca has begun to, to give water to these 10 camels, going above and beyond, probably an hour and a half's worth of work. She's clearly living in the extra mile. Look what it says in Genesis 24, 21. Without saying a word, the man watched her closely to learn whether or not the Lord has made his journey successful. Without saying a word, his jaw drops, not because of how beautiful she looks, but because of the way that she's living her life. He notices something is different about this woman. Have you noticed that people do anything these days to get noticed? Just open up Facebook and you can kind of see for yourself. They'll wear stuff. They'll say things that are inappropriate. They'll post things that should never be posted. We'll do anything these days to get noticed, won't we? So, so let me ask you a question. If you were to do a survey, let's just say South Carolina, maybe United States, say, what, what is the church, what are Christians most noticed for? What do you think that you would hear? Would it be that they're most known for what they believe, for the stands that they take, for the stances that they take? And that's important. Those are all big deals. But would we be noticed for our criticism, for the things that we're against, for the boycotts? Or would we be noticed because we were people who went the extra mile? We were people who serve others. See, people notice when you go the extra mile. You know, Jesus tells this story in the Bible, or actually we see this story about Jesus where they had had a long day of ministry and they were kind of gathering back together in, in a place to have dinner. And as the disciples came in the door, Jesus met them on the floor with a bucket. And he said, hey guys, I, wanna, I just want to take a minute. I want to wash your feet. I want to serve you in this way. And of course, they were like, no, 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 we're going to do this for you. We're going to do this. No, 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 don't, you, you can't do this. But Jesus says, no, 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 I, I want to serve you. And in this moment, as he's kind of on his knees washing their feet, this is where he tells them this passage that most of us have heard before. He says, listen, of all the things that you're going to be known for, the people around you are going to know who I am and who God is for the way that you love each other, for the way that you serve each other. He says, man, I want my people to be known as extra mile kind of people. People will notice, the world will notice when we live and the extra mile. Second thought for you, my relationships are going to flourish in the extra mile. My relationships will flourish in the extra mile. Look at Genesis 24 and verse 67. This is how the passage ends in that chapter. It says, Isaac then brings her into the tent of his mother, Sarah, and he married Rebekah, so she became his wife, and he loved her. Now, a lot happened in between that. Uh, she ends up going back home and, and meeting these servants, and they realize, man, God is in this. There's something happening here. But ultimately, she, on an ordinary day for Rebecca, it turned into one of the most important days of her life, simply because she did more than what was expected of her. Think about that. I don't know how many times she seems like the kind of person that often did that. But a normal, ordinary day for her turned miraculous because she served in the extra mile. And she would always go back and go, man, the day I met, you know, you always talk about how you met your spouse and how you, for her, it was always a, a moment where she served somebody in the extra mile. Her relational breakthrough happened there, happened in serving. Do you want your marriage to flourish? You know, I've been in ministry now for almost 20 years, which is kind of crazy to think about. And I have yet to, Sean, maybe you have, I have yet to sit across from a couple who said, you know what, this just isn't working. The marriage is falling apart because, because she serves me too much. You know? Uh, you know, he just goes above and beyond. He buys me flowers and he serves me too much and I'm over it. I'm out. I'm done. It just doesn't happen. Y you want to see a breakthrough in, in your relationships? Learn to live in the extra mile. Learn to serve in the extra mile. I see some elbows flying. That's good. That's good. To, it's good, good if you elbow a little bit. It's fine. It's fine. 
You know, if you're dating, you know, friends, uh, some of you are there. If the person that you're with right now doesn't show extra mile character, doesn't consistently go the extra mile, can I humbly suggest, and I'm leaving so you don't have to listen to me, but maybe it's not the right person for you. It's it's not just going to get better when you get married. I can promise you that. Are, are, are Are you looking for somebody? Are you being the kind of person that would go the extra mile? If the person that you're with is rude to the servers and the restaurants, but treats you like a queen, can I warn you that after about six months of marriage, you'll become the, the per server at the restaurant? Pay attention to those things. Are they the kind of person who serves, who loves, who lives in the extra mile? You know, the Bible calls us to walk by faith, but it doesn't call us to marry people by faith. And so just kind of think about that. Think about that. Live, live in the extra mile. Learn to, 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 to notice people in the extra mile. The thing that set Rebecca apart from everybody else that day was not her looks. It was the way she served. It's the way she served. So people notice. Relationships flourish. One last thought for you. And this is my favorite. You know, my destiny is often discovered in the extra mile. My destiny is often discovered in the extra mile. Think about this for a second. Would we have ever heard of Rebecca if she hadn't served 10 camels? I don't know that we would ever have heard of her. I don't know that thousands of years later, churches would still be telling her story if she hadn't served in the extra mile. Genesis 24, 60, before her family sent her back, says, they blessed Rebecca and said to her, our sister, may you increase to thousands upon thousands. May your offspring possess the cities of their enemies. It's interesting because that's the very similar to the promise that God gave Abraham. And now, just by serving the extra mile, it had become her promise. And she would become a mother to many, many generations. She discovered her destiny in the extra mile. You know, I was thinking about this as I was praying for y'all and praying for our time together. I never really connected the dots. But, but about 22 years ago, uh, it was, yeah, roughly 22 years ago, I was, had just committed my life to Christ, and I was about 18 years old, and I had grown up in the church and, and had kind of run from God, but I, I, I finally made this commitment, and, and I gave my life to Christ. And, and when you're the rebellious child in a fast-growing megachurch of the lead pastor, everybody starts to kind of hear about your story. It was so annoying. I couldn't get away with anything as a rebellious child in, in Mount Pleasant. But I, my heart was changed, and I gave my life to Christ. And almost immediately, about three, three or four weeks after that, the youth pastor at Seacoast came to me said, Josh, I want you to, I want you to come on a, a youth retreat, and I want you to share your testimony. And I didn't have to pray about it. I knew immediately, no, <laughs> I'm not doing that. That's not my thing. In fact, I thought that the youth pastor was kind of trying a little experiment. Let's see if... If, if the pastor's kid has anything in him. But I knew I didn't want to go into ministry. I was in college. I, I had plans for my life. No, 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 I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. So I said no. And then uh, a couple of weeks would pass, and I couldn't kind of get past this idea that God was actually calling me to step in to this moment. Several of my friends told me, Josh, you need to, you need to consider doing this. And so you know what? I, I finally went back to that youth pastor and said, okay, I'll share my story. You know what happened immediately as soon as I said yes? Anxiety. I'd love to tell you, like, the glory of the Lord showed up and, you know, it all. No, I, I was filled with anxiety. I was afraid. I didn't want to do it. I, I lost sleep for the next six weeks or so. I couldn't sleep at all. But I knew that God had called me to say yes to something that I would normally say no to. And so I did it. I went. And just, this is Josh's story. It may not be yours. But as I look back on my life, on the first day of that trip, it's a ski trip, going to share my testimony that night, I'm out on the slopes and I get into line, I'd gotten separated from my friends and this cute blonde pulls up next to me who had also gotten separated from her friends and her name's Lisa. And I actually showed you a picture of her earlier. We get onto a ski lift and as we're getting ready to go up the mountain together, had just met her, never met her before, met her in that line, the ski lift broke. Two and a half hours later, we get off. Some of y'all got game on your own. God had to intervene divinely for me. But literally, I met my wife 
in, in a step of obedience. And, and because I was nervous and I was sharing that night, I didn't know her, didn't think I'd ever really see her again. So I kind of shared where I was. I was like, man, I'm speaking tonight. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I've never done this before. And I don't know what I'm going to say. And she said, well, why don't you just tell me your story? And so on that ski lift, I shared my story with her, shared my testimony. And we began to connect. That night I got up and I just blubbered my way through trying to tell what God had done in my life. And the Holy Spirit showed up in a crazy powerful way, much like he does here at Freedom Church. And 125 kids that night gave their life to Christ. So in this moment of, for me, and I don't get it right most of the time, but in this moment of saying, yes, I'll go the extra mile, I met my, my future wife, and I also discovered what God had called me to do with my life. I remember sitting down with a youth pastor afterwards and going, what was that? That was amazing. But I, what, what? And he said, you know what that was? That was the hand of God on your life, and he's calling you to step into ministry. And today, years and years later, everything that I love about my life was born in that moment in the extra mile. The privilege that I have to stand before Seacoast Church as a lead pastor and to serve that great community, the, the, the woman that I married, my kids, all of that was born in saying yes to something that I would normally have said no to. You know, we can often discover our destiny in the extra mile. I don't know where God's calling you, Freedom Church, to take that step. Is it in your marriage? Is it in your family? What if, what if the things that you will love the most about your life tomorrow are gonna come out of you going the extra mile today? What if the things that you, you, you just go, God, I can't believe that you're allowing me to do this. What if those would be born out of you going, you know what, I'm gonna step up. It's not normally like me to, join the dream team and get involved or serve in different areas or I'm not sure I would normally find myself serving at BBS you know on a week in my summertime giving of my time but you know what I'm going to go yes God I'm going to I'm going to say yes to what you've called me to do could be in giving some of you are like you know I'm not I'm not really I, I, I'm good with kind of tipping God but I've never really been one to go the extra mile what if and your sacrifice and your willingness to go the extra mile, what if there was a miracle there? What if, what if the, the, the thing you've been praying for, the blessing that you need, even in your finances, is gonna be born out of you going the extra mile? You know, people notice when you go the extra mile, your relationships are gonna thrive and ultimately, you're gonna discover your destiny in the extra mile. Can I invite you to pray with me as we ask God, to, to open up his, his will and his life for us. God, I thank you so much for this incredible church. God, I am blown away at what you're doing at Freedom Church. God, I just pray, Lord, that as we gather together, that you would bubble up the things that you've called us to do. Lord, not because we wanna earn favor with you, not because we want to impress you. God, you've done everything that, that we need and dying on the cross so that we could be free from sin and guilt and, and first mile living. So God, let us be a people who step up and step in to all that you have for us. God, I pray for those who might be struggling right now, could be in a marriage or in a relationship, God. Would you give them just a divine, Lord, word where they can serve, they can humble themselves and serve in the extra mile. God, for those of us that are struggling, maybe even with our kids, God, would you help us to see where living like you, modeling what you've called us to be, would be a, an area of breakthrough in our relationships. And God, I pray, Lord, that as this church continues to step in and step up into the extra mile, that the, the, the city of Monk's Corner, Berkeley County, Charleston, South Carolina would look at this place and they would see, Lord, your light shining people would notice this is a place where people serve. This is a place where people live in the extra mile. God, thank you for going the extra mile for us. Thank you for going all the way to the cross, for not stopping, Lord, short, but for going all the way so that we could be free, Lord, so that we could, we, we could, we could live these lives of abundance, extraordinary grace. Lord, I pray a blessing over this church in Jesus' name.